Good evening. I'm Adrian Schenker, he, him, his pronouns, Executive Director of Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center. Hi, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you for having us. Um, how the book got started is I moved to Philadelphia in 2015 from Boston, and I had just finished my master's degree. I went back to school to get my master's in history. And my thesis for my master's was in gay history. And so I wanted to continue working, working in that vein. And so I looked around and I found the LGBT Center in, in Harrisburg. And I contacted Barry, who was the head of it and the director of the, the, the history project, and um, asked him what he was doing and how I could be able to help. And Barry handed me 50 oral histories uh, that he had done, that the, the group had done. And I took them home and I read them and I was blown away. I was mesmerized and blown away by these stories of uh, harassment, discrimination, how the net was formed. Um, and I realized that I'd been living in a bubble my entire life. I'd lived in, in large urban areas like Houston and Boston and then Philadelphia. And I realized that uh, that what I had gone through had, had nothing to do with how people in these non-urban areas and how they had to deal uh, with the complexities of being gay uh, and what it was like. Because um, basically when you live in large urban areas, you have gay neighborhoods, you had social networks built in. I could walk out my door and there were other gay people. Uh, there was medical services, medical facilities. Uh, there were activist organizations you know, abound. There were clubs and uh, social outlets, and none of that experience that I had related to what was going on in central Pennsylvania. Well, I told Barry, I said, this would make a great book. I said, but the trouble would be finding a publisher. Um, well, as serendipity would have it, Barry had, about a year prior to that, had written an article about what he was doing at the History Project, collecting these oral histories. And uh, the editor at Penn State Press had seen this and she contacted Barry and said, we saw what you're doing and this could make a, really make a great book. Would anybody on your staff be willing to work with this developing a book club? Well, hello, me. And so uh, we sat down with, uh, with Penn State and developed a book proposal and it took about nine months. And so after that, we got the contact and then it took about three years to write this book. And um, what was different about the book, the thing that we wanted to point out was when you think about gay life, people generally think about large urban areas like New York, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, San Francisco. You don't think about non-urban areas and uh, how the gay community formed. Certainly there have been books written about non about rural areas, but those books generally focus in on race, class, gender, and how those affect gay life. Or they're just coming out stories, not the belittle coming out stories. Uh, but none of those books focus on a community as a whole. And that was what I wanted to focus in on how this community developed in a non-urban area. And that's the story here. How this community developed with no anti-discrimination law, with no gay neighborhood, with no network, so to speak, social network to speak of, how this all came about and how it formed and coalesced. And that's the story. And so um, we tried to figure out, I tried to figure out, well, how am I gonna write this? Am I gonna write it in chapters about discrimination or harassment? And so Penn State is one that said, well, why don't you take it by decades? And when you look at it that way, then the book just suddenly fell into place. And so I sat down with Barry and said, okay, we'll start with the 60s, because that's when, our, when most of the old histories began and what we had. And what happened in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, and you put it that way, well then, what happened? What were the networks? And what were the organizations we should talk about? Who were the people? Who were the key players? Who we should talk about? What were the events? And when you put it together, then this timeline developed and then everything just kind of fell into place on what we should talk about and where it should go. And so that's how the book kind of came about. And um, I think it's a really great and interesting story. 
in chapter one, we were in the very beginnings about the early gay life, trying in the 60s, like what happened. We kind of profile some coming out stories about what people went through back in the 60s, what was it like growing up gay, what were their coming out stories were like, what was their family's reaction was in the, in, when they found out. Um, then we kind of go into early bar life in Harrisburg, a little bit in Lancaster, New um, York. There wasn't much. Um, and then we went into some early police raids that took place in Harrisburg and a, a little bit of harassment that went on uh, in the 60s. Uh, then we move into the 70s. And that's like right after Stonewall happened. And that was the emergence of some social networks that started happening. There were a few people that were influenced by what happened in Stonewall. They came back, were aware that you got to come out, we got to form some groups. And some people wanted something other than the gay bars in order to meet other people. And the first groups that actually formed were religious groups, the Dignity Central, Metropolitan Community Church. Um, and they did have religious services, but what was interesting is that they also had social activities. And those social activities actually began to draw more people than the services did. Uh, there were volleyball games, there was uh, potluck suppers and stuff like that. But then people began to meet other people. Um, then we uh, chronicle the Latin, there was also not many um, organized bars, there's maybe one bar or two for women, uh, but a woman named uh, Lorraine, she wanted to find another outlet for uh, women, how they could meet. So she organized a thing called the Lavender Letter. It was a newsletter, and at first she was organizing uh, events like potluck suppers, men in the theater, bowling, uh, where women could sign up for these newsletters. They would be like called Jane at this number. And then the women were screened, and they would find out, well, there's going to be a gathering here. And then women could go and they would meet other women. Again, another alternative to the bar line. But then they were developing again these social networks. Um, we also talk about the advent of the gay era newspaper. There were no newspapers basically in central Pennsylvania. Uh, a man by the name of David Lee's founded the gay era newspaper. And uh, and he was taking uh, news releases from the gay community news in Boston, the advocate out in LA, and turning this paper where the people in central Pennsylvania. We're getting the news of what was happening across the country as far as gay liberation and the fight for human rights. So they making the community aware of what was going on. And then also because of the threat of activism, we kind of chronicle the rise of student activism about what happened in Penn State and the formation of HOTS, uh, this homophiles of Penn State. Uh, and when Penn State gave it its charter, then rejected it, pulled it back, and their fight to get the charter renewed and the first student activism organization. And um, there was also a personal story about one of its members, Joe Ancantora, um, who was obviously out. He was going for his teaching license, and uh, Penn State did not want to give it to him. They picked it up to the Pennsylvania Board of Education, Sector of Education. He finally did grant it, but he was, Joe was teaching at that point in uh, Maryland. When they found out about it, they fired him. Joe went to court. It went all the way. Uh, he lost his case, but he got a lot of publicity. It was a very traumatic and mesmerizing story, but we do all that, we cover all that. Um, then we go into, uh, Barry, why don't you take over from here and talk about what happened with Governor Schaaf. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, in the next chapter, we talk about um, Governor Schaap's administration. And um, Governor Schaap was uh, really ahead of his time. He was the first governor to issue an executive order which prohibited discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in employment for state employees. Um, this was pretty groundbreaking in 1975. Um, California would be the second state to uh, provide those protections in 1978. So it was um, extremely important um, in terms of um, national significance. Um, and Governor Schaap also um, started, uh, he was the first governor to really meet officially with um, 
LGBTQ activists. Um, Mark Siegel, who had founded the um, Gay Raiders in Philadelphia, uh, who's the current publisher of, of Philadelphia Gay News, so that name should be familiar to many people in, in Pennsylvania. Um, then Mark was a young activist and had um, perfected a uh, technique called the ZAP. Um, and um, he used that particular surprise action um, very effectively in many places. And one of those places was actually to interrupt the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Um, and he interrupted him live on the air. And this was um, a uh, time when there were only three major networks and they, uh, people were glued to, uh, to watch the news uh, every night. And um, so it had a big impact. Um, basically, he held up a sign in front of uh, Cronkite and saying, uh, uh, gay rights now or something to that effect. Um, and so um, anyway, uh, he wrote to Governor Schaap um, after that event and asked if there was a possibility that they could meet and discuss um, providing um, uh, support for gay rights in the Commonwealth. Well, um, I've got a, a short reading that I can do actually from the book. Um, and so the next day when Siegel and Langhorn walked into the room, the governor immediately walked over to Siegel with his hand extended and said, smiling, I've seen you on TV. When Siegel did not seem to understand, the governor added, Cronkite seemed to be surprised to meet you, but I'm not. And Siegel was completely disarmed and felt quickly comfortable with Schaap. They talked for a while, and the governor, rather than asking what, Schaap, what Siegel could do for him, instead asked what he could do to help Siegel's cause. According to Siegel, I always go for the brass ring. So I said, Governor, gay men and lesbians are discriminated against in most every part of state government. Schaap immediately responded, how can we change that? Siegel replied, create a commission to explore these problems and find solutions. Schaap immediately responded, let me consider the options and get back to you. So he did. And uh, what, what happened what next was that he started um, inviting um, activists from all over the state to meet with him, uh, his staff, and representatives from agencies throughout state government. And um, that basically, that series of meetings um, eventually resulted in the uh, um, executive order for non-discrimination for state employees in April of 75. And then next in, in uh, February of 1976, a second executive order, which created the Pennsylvania Council for Sexual Minorities which was a, the first governmental body anywhere in the United States that was created to provide um, improvements to public policy for LGBTQ people. So that was an extremely important development. Um, again, nowhere in the country, perhaps anywhere in the world, can we find any evidence of a, uh, an official governmental body created for such a purpose. So, um, Anyway, then uh, uh, another thing that came about from this um, uh, council was that a number of, of the rural gay activists in Pennsylvania started caucusing after the meetings. Um, this was really an opportunity to meet people that they had, a lot of whom had never met each other um, or certainly had worked with each other. So. It was a way to connect all of these small organizations throughout central Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania, even into western Pennsylvania, uh, in the more rural parts of the state and smaller cities, um, where they could start talking about ways to work together to accomplish things that they would not have been able to accomplish with individual organizations in small cities. So one of the first things they did was they uh, they held a gay conference in Harrisburg. It was the first statewide LGBT conference um, in the state in 1975. And they went on to have a series of those con conferences every year for several years. Um, and uh, these conferences had a lot of workshops and a lot of 
educational programs uh, so that the community could start not only connecting and talking about all these issues, but learning uh, from each other. Um, the other important thing that they did was they uh, created the first Gay Education Day in 1976, which was a gay lobby day. And more than 100 people from all over the state descended on Harrisburg and the state legislature to uh, lobby the legislature for um, uh, civil rights protections and, and other issues related to the LGBT community. Um, and then in the next chapter, um, we talk about, um, it's called turbulence uh, for a good reason, because we talk about the AIDS crisis that hit in the 1980s. Um, there was a um, significant, um, uh, people were afraid, of course, it was very early in the epidemic um, in the early 80s, uh, people did not know really what caused uh, AIDS. Um, and so it was a, a point of time that was of grave concern to a lot of people. And one of the individuals that um, got uh, HIV and AIDS uh, early in the epidemic was Gary Norton. And Gary was a figure that was pretty, who was pretty prominent in the community throughout central PA. He was, he was living in Williamsport originally and then started a number of the gay groups up in that part of the state um, and then moved to Harrisburg and was instrumental in starting MCC, the Metropolitan Community Church in Harrisburg and was involved in many other organizations and activities. Um, so his, uh, his becoming ill from the disease caused quite a, a concern. And um, he was, I think, really the first prominent or, or well-known person in the community to die from AIDS in Central PA. And his um, illness and death really galvanized the community towards doing something. And um, uh, Roger Beatty and Frank Azzoli and a number of other people got together in a series of meetings to form the South Central, Pencil uh, South Central AIDS Assistance Network in Harrisburg, based in Harrisburg, but really active throughout Central PA. Um, and that organization, initially an all-volunteer group, eventually they raised enough funds that they were able to hire a director and then eventually uh, further on uh, more funds and more um, staff for the organization. And there were small um, AIDS organizations like this created uh, throughout Central PA and Eastern PA, uh, including one in Reading and one in Lancaster and York and Williamsport and, and many other uh, communities. So these organizations were really the, the way that, that people responded to the epidemic in Central PA to try to uh, help um, AIDS patients um, individually and, and through uh, support through the organizations, through the body system and also through uh, funding for um, rent and, and expenses and drugs and other, other uh, things that, that were needed by the patients. And then um, toward the uh, end of the 80s, around 1990, um, there became uh, a need for um, places where, where people could be cared for as they die. And uh, Joy Euphema, um, who was really the mother of the uh, movement of um, hospice care in this country. Um, had actually had a movie about her life uh, that was produced. Um, and um, Joy was thinking about what to do next in her life. And she um, decided she would open an AIDS hospice in York. And it's called the York House Hospice. And that was one of the few AIDS um, or dedicated AIDS hospices in the country. Um, there were not a lot that dealt specific, specifically just for AIDS uh, care. And um, so that was a very significant development in our local um, region as well. And um, that hospice was actually documented in photographs um, in an exhibit at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington that went on and toured around the country. Um, so it became uh, well-known. Um, 
Bill, you want to talk about uh, the next chapter, which goes into the battles for the uh, local non-discrimination ordinances? <clears throat> yeah, the next, the next chapter is called Battles. And it moves into the 80s and 90s and the fight for passage for anti-discrimination ordinances, basically in um, Harrisburg, uh, Lancaster, New York. Um, Philadelphia was actually the first city to, uh, to pass an anti-discrimination ordinance <clears throat> in 1982. And then followed shortly there by, by Harrisburg. Um, what's unique about all these cities is that uh, what they have in common is that the prevailing argument against the passage <clears throat> were all religious based, you know, as it was in the entire country. And you look at the fight, uh, the fight they had in Colorado and in um, Oregon and California, uh, they all were religious based. And if you pass these ordinances, we're going to fall in the hands of God's and immortality, you're going to put in hell. Uh, <clears throat> when you read some of these things, these people said, it, it makes your skin crawl. Um, but uh, what was unique about the Harrisburg Ordinance is that it was the only one that passed unanimously, and it was the only one that included uh, uh, sexual uh, gender identity. Uh, so that, back in 1983, was granted. Um, the fight in Lancaster took place in 1991. Uh, again, it was a, a hairy fight. Uh, it was harried because the Ku Klux Klan showed up to protest. Uh, they marched down the streets. Uh, it was quite a to-do. Um, again, religious-based arguments were thrown back and forth. Um, and uh, I was going to do. I, I'm not. I'm not going to take time for the reading because I don't want to keep taking time on it. But what was interesting about in Lancaster during that time period. One of the leaders of the fight was a woman by the name of Nancy Helm. And so she became quite well known in the town because of her fight for this anti-discrimination order. But at the same time, she, she opened a bookstore, a gay bookstore. That was one of her dreams because you know, she loved reading and she used to go to Philadelphia to Giovanni's room. Uh, and she wanted to kind of replicate that in Lancaster. So she opened a bookstore on Main Street in, in Lancaster. Well, because of her notoriety for the fight in Lancaster, immediately she started getting, you know, death threats and um, threats against her bookstore. And like three months after she opened, her bookstore was firebombed. She cleaned it up, went back into business, and like about another few months later, it was firebombed again, this time with more damage. Uh, the police came and they looked at it, they tried to but they couldn't find no clues on who was doing it. And, um, and so she became more and more alarmed. She kept getting the death threats. She was followed around town, called names, uh, you, you know, the effing, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so she became worried and concerned about herself and the well being of her customers, and she just really couldn't take it. And so a year to the day after she opened it, she closed the bookstore. She was forced to close it. Um, and about three weeks after she closed it, they actually did find the people that uh, firebombed their bookstore and they were brought to trial. Um, I had uh, the, the honor of interviewing Nancy for the book. We profiled her in this book. And 30 years later, after this incident, she still had tears in her eyes. The, the pain is, was still there of what she went through, uh, knowing the fight for the passage of the ordinance in Lancaster, but having a dream firebombed and destroyed. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I was li living in Boston in the 90s. We had three bookstores, three bookstores in Boston. No one would have thought about firebombing them. I mean, that's what sent chills down my spine. And uh, I hope I did her justice in retelling the story. Uh, Lancaster followed a couple of years later in the passage of their ordinance. And what was unique about their, their ordinance, it was sponsored by their mayor, uh, William Al Alpass, uh, a man like, you know, Milton Shaft, a straight man. Um, he was head of the Council of Mayors for the, for the, the whole U.S. Council of Mayors. And uh, 
he was kind of near, neither here nor there on gay rights. But when the Council of Mayors that year was going to meet in Colorado, and that's the year that <clears throat> Colorado passed that horrendous ordinance denying different gay rights, uh, denying rights to all gay and lesbian people. Uh, he was so appalled by that that the U.S. Council of Mayors moved their conference out of Colorado. And from that incident, he became an advocate and an ally for gay and lesbian rights. And he came back committed to passing that or ordinance for the city of York. And he helped pass that legislation and um, helped change what was going on in New York. So those are really three amazing stories with some really three, uh, some amazing individuals that helped fight and change that the complexion in Harrisburg and Lancaster and New York. They're really some incredible stories. Um, the next chapter goes into gay pride in central Pennsylvania. And it kind of chronicles, you know, gay pride started happening the year after Stonewall. And um, in cities all across the nation and the world. But gay pride didn't happen in central Pennsylvania until 14 years later. Uh, and it was done with no fanfare, no advertising. The, gay, the word gay was not even in the title. It was called Open Air Festival. And that went on for a couple of years. And finally, uh, that stopped. And then uh, it was changed to the name of Unity Festival, kind of a fundraiser for AIDS. And that went on for a couple more years. And then uh, it finally changed into 1992 into the Gay and Lesbian uh, uh, festival where the word gay was put into it. But what was interesting, even when um, when it first happened in the big cities in the large urban areas, they were, in, when it first happened in 84, 85, the big cities were in the middle of protesting the AIDS crisis, gays and military, talking about marriage and quality at that point. Uh, in central Pennsylvania, it was more of a coming out, uh, celebration of coming out and taking pride in yourself. So the tone of gay pride in central Pennsylvania has always been um, different than what it is in not as political as it has been in the large urban areas. More of a sense of pride and um, uh, more, of, more of a sense of pride, a true pride. And um, although later in the 21st century, some politics has come into it, but not like you see in the larger urban areas. Uh, Barry, do you wanna talk about the last chapter? Sure. Um, yeah, the last chapter we talk about um, sort of the maturation of the community in central Pennsylvania, um, how it had grown as together in, in support of a lot of different um, uh, networks and, and working together and uh, it, it uh, leads us into um, a couple of stories that were kind of interesting. Um, one was the uh, lawsuit by Jennifer Harris against Penn State. Um, she had been a player on the women's basketball team and um, the uh, coach had uh, basically removed her from the team for being a lesbian. Um, and so we tell her story about the efforts to get reinstated and uh, and so forth. Um, we also talk about um, the emergence of transgender social networks in Central PA. Um, you know, there was originally an organization called Renaissance Education Association, but then uh, out of that grew a number of individuals from that group that founded Trans Central Pennsylvania, Trans Central PA. Um, and Trans Central PA has um, developed over the past, um, I'd say 20 years that um, uh, to really uh, take uh, a major role in uh, trans transgender civil rights in, in Central PA. Um, they have um, had a, a conference, an annual conference every year called the Keystone Conference in Harrisburg, um, which has grown into one of the major transgender events um, in the country, um, having 700 to 800 attendees every year. Um, of course, this year, unfortunately, with COVID, they were not able to hold it, but um, it's been a, a major, um, had a major impact on the transgender uh, 
movement in central PA. Um, and also we talk about Mara Kiesling, who was uh, from uh, suburban Harrisburg, who grew up and trans transitioned, uh, was involved in Transcentral PA for a while, and then um, became a national leader and spokesperson for the movement um, in Washington, National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, we also talk about the um, development of the LGBT Center in Central Pennsylvania, um, how that came about through a number of volunteer efforts um, initially, and then um, how uh, they were able to raise the funds to hire their first executive director, Lee Marvin, and uh, eventually expand their programming um, into many other areas. So um, it really comes full circle to show how the community has evolved uh, from just a series of very small initial uh, organizations to um, uh, really a professional uh, run, professionally run um, network of organizations. Um, the book, uh, by the way, has about 86 photographs um, which really add a lot to the telling of all these stories. Um, and there are really so many um, individual stories and profiles that are told in this book that really, um, I think, bring alive the experience of many activists and many people growing up in this area uh, felt in, uh, in what they did and what they were able to accomplish in Central PA. So. Um, with that, I think I'll let uh, Adrian uh, back into uh, the conversation and uh, see if he has any questions. Well, thank you so much, both Bill and Barry, for first off, for putting this book together, because it's such a valuable resource for future mm -hmm. generations to learn about what happened even before they were born. Um, the, the paths that were paved by, by activists before us is is really important. And sometimes when it comes to LGBT history, it can be hard to learn this information. Um, so thanks for putting the book together. And of course, thank you for joining us uh, virtually in the Lehigh Valley tonight uh, for LGBT History Month. Um, I wanted to ask if you could speak to, you know, um, why local history? Um, you know, so much of the conversation about LGBT History Month mm -hmm. is about, you know, national LGBT history or major national, um, occasions uh, throughout our history. But this entire book is really the first book written about local LGBT history in central Pennsylvania. So uh, can you zero in on why that, why that focus is so important? Well, I think that's the, the singular importance of this book because um, when you look at gay history, because uh, I was struck when I was you know, getting, going back to school, uh, and get my, getting my bachelor's and my master's, you know, we would take courses in American studies or, you know, you know gender studies. You're, you're given these books like, you know, Gay New York or Men Like That. And there are all these large urban areas that you're, you're, you're being told about. And when you think about gay histories, the mind immediately goes to these large urban cities. Like, why is, why is New York and San Francisco and Chicago the only places you can hear about gay history and the activists that, that did things there. You know, gay history takes place in a lot of different places. And there's a lot of different aspects to what, what comprises gay history. It, it splinters off in so many different directions. Um, so, um, that's like I said, after I read these, these the first 50 uh, oral histories that Barry gave me, you know, it was like, you know, how this gay community formed in a non-urban area. That's a part of gay history. You know, it, it can't be overlooked and it can't be forgotten about because that's a slice of gay life, uh, just as it is of like how, how men left, like the, the book of Slippers of Gold, uh, Boots of Leather, Slippers of Lace, or whatever it is, about bar, uh, lesbian life, in Buffalo, New Bar Life in Buffalo, New York. That's a part of gay history. That's a sliver of it. 
that, that's a story that needs to be told. Well, you know, it's the same is true with this. It's like people need to understand how gay communities form, how they function, how these the, the battle for anti discrimination that took place in Harrisburg, Lancaster, New York. Who are those people were? Those are just as much as giants of the fight for human rights as the people that fought for marriage equality. I mean, they they stand on the street. They're just as much giants as anybody else because they fought the battle. They stood up and they count. They made themselves known. So that's why this is important. Uh, very. I don't mean to get passionate about it, but I'm very passionate about it. Well, and passion is so important, especially when we're talking about, um, especially when we're talking about our activist movements. Um, you know, B Barry, you've been working in Central Pennsylvania, archiving and documenting, preserving LGBT history for many years, um, uh, and and that local LGBT history that, that that Bill just spoke about the importance of. Can you share, you know, what what has um, surprised you? What has inspired you? Um, you know, there are some narratives, there are some stories in this book where uh, you know you hide, you pull out some stories from the oral histories that you've collected. Can you can you just share, you know, um, either what surprised or what continues to inspire you about these these earlier activists, the history and the community where you live? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've been working since 2012 to gather these stories and discover this history and. It's really been amazing to me. Um, I did. I wasn't born here. I, I grew up in upstate New York, but also in a similar kind of area, small cities, rural areas. Um, and I moved to Central PA in 1983. And I, um, so I've lived a lot of the history that's gone on in Central PA, but I also didn't know a lot about the history that came before me. And um, so the people that I met here um, who started sharing their stories anecdotally to me individually um, when, I, when I started uh, meeting friends. Um, I was pretty impressed by the fact that the community had, had built as much as it had um, up until 1983. Um, they'd come an incredibly long way at that point. So um, going back and then um, to, to interview a lot of these people for oral history interviews and find out more extensively about the story of the history here. Um, I was blown away, as, as Bill mentioned, you know, um, by the fact that there were, there were so many stories of individual sacrifice and discrimination and, um, you know, that, that people uh, really struggled with um, being able to create this community here. Um, and individual stories like Dan Manneville up in Williamsport who basically lost his home. Um, his, his home was vandalized to the point of not being able to live in it after he appeared on a, on a local television station, um, which uh, was, you know, in protest of an appearance by Anita Bryant at the Bloomsburg Fair. You know, that story was just incredible to me that, um, you know, here this was his boyhood home that he had inherited from his parents and, you know, he lost that. His parent, his father built that house. So, you know, these are just um, incredible stories of sacrifice that people went through. Um, and, you know, as Bill mentioned, the, the, the bookstore in, in Lancaster, the, um, there's so many others like, um, you know, and from, from people even who are uh, allies, um, uh, I can think of, um, um, you know, Rick Schultz's mother, um, who had um, testified in favor of the ordinance in um, Harrisburg, the passage of the ordinance there, and had to give her name and, and address, of course, when she testified in front of city council. Um, and soon after that, there was a fire set at her apartment. Um, someone set a, a, a put a, a, tra a stack of religious tracts in front of her door to her apartment and set it on fire. Um, so, you know, these are um, amazing stories that people had to endure this kind of, uh, you know, uh, actions. Ultimately, I found reading out in Central Pennsylvania that it's an uplifting book. 
um, yes, there are some stories um, that are traumatic and there are some stories that are, um, that, that, that don't always have happy endings. But ultimately, as an activist, I, I found that reading, reading this book uh, was inspiring to, to, to know the history of so many people who came before me. Um, and I think that many of your readers will probably feel similarly that this is a really uplifting, inspiring book. One thing I also noticed is that, you know, having read, you know, a number of other books that uh, memoirs or, or other LGBT history books, if you read, um, you know, uh, Cleve Jones's book, When We Rise, is an example, it follows the same, the same path, uh, the same journey um, through time. And uh, basically a journey of, you know, roughly 1960s through, you know, mid 90s, early 2000s. And, uh, and, and what I found reading out in central Pennsylvania was that I could then connect these national moments to what was happening here in Pennsylvania. So yeah, at the same time as Stonewall, um, you know, Lehigh Ho was organizing in Pennsylvania. And, you know, so re reading, reading about these different local groups and local actions and local organizers, I found really powerful. I want to encourage our community to consider purchasing a copy out in central Pennsylvania. Um, there's a link to purchase the book with a percentage that will actually come back to Bradbury Sullivan Center. Um, if you purchase through that link, it's in the chat on Facebook Live or in the comments um, in YouTube. And um, uh, we certainly want to encourage that. Uh, bookshop.org also provides support back to local bookstores, which is so important during this pandemic. Um, and I want to just close by, by again, thanking our supporters, Pennsylvania Humanities Council, um, uh, the state federal partner of National Endowment for Humanities, um, whose grant through the, the CARES Act funds that they were awarded has supported um, arts and culture programs at Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center, as well as a grant from Air Products, which is supporting our virtual cultural pro uh, programs through this pandemic. We want to remind our community that um, you know, we have a many, many, many virtual events, including cultural events like this one, as well as support groups and community groups. And they're all at bradburysullivancenter.org slash events, and all of them are free to attend. Uh, plus, uh, we have lots of information on our website about how LGBTQ plus people can stay safe from the dangerous coronavirus. And so you can get that information at bradburysullivancenter.org slash coronavirus. And with that, we want to um, thank Barry and Bill once more for joining us virtually uh, in the Lehigh Valley and encourage folks to check out their book out in central Pennsylvania. Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.